this is Diana Scott. I've got your weekly medical update for HCC. This was originally planned to be an interview style um, update and that got changed at the last minute. Things happen. So it's a little bit rough as far as what we've got prepared for you, but I can give you some uh, information. I'm going to basically answer the questions that were intended to be used for the um, interview. We'll start with the current local data. As of this update, the data shows 73 new cases of COVID-19 in the past 24 hours with one death in the state of Oregon. There were no new deaths in Lynn County, which has a total of 37 cases and one death since the beginning. There are 899 cases in Oregon with a total of 22 deaths. The first question that was proposed was, can you update us on how many cases? I've got that, but one part of that question was how many cases in Sweet Home? Data isn't kept for cities. The way data is kept for um, public health emergencies such as this is that counties keep data. So Lane County, Benton County, the various counties keep data through their health, de health departments. That data is reported to the state health authority and the state health authority reports their data nationally to the CDC. So I can't give you data for Sweet Home itself. The closest we can get is Lane County. How many have passed away I'm sorry, how many passed away in Oregon? We got that. Uh, 22 have passed away in Oregon since the beginning and two in Lynn County. Um, so President Trump's team says we could have from 100,000 to 240,000 deaths from COVID-19. If people will follow CDC guidelines, can we see those numbers drop? Well, that's what we hope for and that's what the models tell us. If people follow the recommendations for distancing, for hand washing, and for cleaning, that would decrease the number of exposures. This is all, again, a novel virus, so we're operating off best knowledge and best practices. The next question is, I would like for you to share a little bit about some of the falsehoods that are being spread from doctors, so-called doctors and nurses, if you can. First, um, I would say that Dr. Google, Google uh, is a blessing and a curse. Anyone can say, uh, that they are anything on the internet and good people believe what's being said without knowing anything about the person speaking. If you cannot verify the person's background, their reputation, their medical skill set, then I would advise not listening to that person. If you don't know how to do that or you don't want to take the time to find that stuff out, you're better off not listening. Follow known reliable sources only the state health authority, the CDC. If you want to avoid government sites, you're a person who doesn't uh, want to follow government information, then use reputable medical sources such as the Mayo Clinic, WebMD is okay in this particular instance, Medscape, places that are peer reviewed and regarded by the medical community as being reliable. Avoid conspiracy sites and sites that are fear mongering. What you want is pure truth information that's delivered without fear mongering. The CDC has a great site, by the way, that's called Mythbusters. I advise you to look at that if you're looking for some information about COVID-19. The next question is that we know that our washing our hands, not touching our face, and keeping a six-foot distance and staying away from sick people is our sick people is our best defense. Is there anything that you can add to that to help protect each other? So um, avoiding touching your face, that's a tough one. You touch your face so many times during the day. This is where the homemade mask might have a purpose. It has no purpose really um, with any evidence in keeping you safe from coronavirus. But what it does do when you wear a mask is it keeps you from touching your face. So if you're a, somebody who sews or knows somebody who sews who's making homemade masks, that's where that homemade mask might come in handy is to, to help you learn not to touch your face. Cleaning frequently touched surfaces in your home with those normal household cleansers is recommended. Don't go to town unless you need something essential. These are some good um, recommendations for how to reduce your exposure. Strategize how to stay busy and entertained in your own home. And while sunlight does not kill the virus, it does help you feel better. So get outdoors, get some outdoor activity in your yard, eat healthy, stay hydrated, take your regular medications as directed. Taking large quantities of vitamins is not helpful. Vitamin C has not been shown to make a difference. The next question, last week you shared with us what symptoms to look for and what were not symptoms. Can you share those again briefly? This virus will look like a cough type of a cold to many people. Its hallmarks are cough, a fever that may be very high, and shortness of breath. 
it is time to be concerned when that mild shortness of breath with coughing becomes difficulty breathing at rest or with minimal movement or activity. Also, any shortness of breath in people with certain medical conditions that impair the immune system or with respiratory issues is a concern and you should contact your medical provider for that. The next question, one of the things we've talked about in our home is how the virus can transfer. Even staying safe, handling money, money or using your debit card, you are touching things that others have touched, things on shelves at the store. Can you share with us best ways to keep this type of transfer down? Well, first, don't go to the store unless you absolutely need to for essential items. Then buy foods that are prepackaged or make sure you wash them before eating them if you're buying uh, single type fruits and vegetables. Open packages in a way that you don't touch the items that are inside the package. You open the pasta package without touching the pasta, drop it right into the boiled water, throw the package away, wash your hands. Just kind of some common sense type stuff. Another thing you can do if you're able to do so is whatever you buy, shelf it somewhere by itself for three days and then take it out and use it and that's been shown to be effective. This is a question that is asked often, is eating out safe? That's a, that is a tough one. What I have seen myself in the drive throughs that I have gone through while I was working was encouraging. Staff are wearing gloves at all times. What I can see is good hygiene practices are being enforced, but you do not know what happens out of sight. If you feel that you need to eat from a delivery or a curbside food service, choose one you trust. I also would advise that you can ask them what they're doing to keep you safe and, and see what kind of answer you get from them. Finally, it says, uh, in closing, is there anything else you'd like to share with us that will help us to flatten the curve and will you briefly explain what that means? So flattening the curve means to take the same number of cases and spread them out more evenly over a period of time as opposed to having a sharp rise and decline, we spread those cases out over a more even, evenly over a period of time. And the benefit of that is it allows limited medical resources to be maintained in order to be available when needed. If all the cases happen in a short period of time, then it uses up resources faster than they can be replaced, resulting in a shortage of necessary supplies such as masks, um, gowns, face shields, ventilators, hospital beds, and frankly, medical providers, medical assistants, nurses aides, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and physicians. So be safe out there, take care of each other, and stay social distanced. That's the end of today's update.